Thank you very much for your patience. I'd like to Thank welcome everyone back. Uh, first of all, this is the International Women's Day and we're very privileged and very honored to have one of the leading women economists and that is <laughs> quite a thing to be in this a world of, you know, it is a men's domain economics and it's just great to see you know, women like Pavlina or Mariana Mazzucato or Kate Raworth and a number of others who have in the meantime just made an incredible impact in a short amount of time. And the second thing and what's very special about this on this day is we're talking about a job guarantee. And although I think we've, we've sort of put an emphasis on this being part of the Green New Deal, but probably even more important is it's about social justice. And you know, with regard to jobs, if there's you know, one of the groups that have always, always, always been on the sharp end of the stick, it's been women. And this is one of the things which uh, Pavlina addresses with regard to the job guarantee. All right, I'll stop there because we do not have much time. She's going to leave us after an hour and a half. She has another appointment. Let me just go through the formalities. First of all, we'd like to thank Hella Panke and the Luxembourg Stiftung for making this possible. We have two new translators, uh, that's Mona and Florian, at which point I shall tell you in German, wenn Sie dieses, uh, diesen Vortrag auf Deutsch hören wollen, es gibt unten ein Dolmetschen uh, Button. Drucken Sie einfach auf Dolmetschen und dann kriegen Sie das alles auf Deutsch mit. In the course of the talk, you can um, pose questions, which we will then collect for the end when she, uh, Pavlina's finished. You do that by going to the chat button, also at the bottom. Uh, I'll say that in German. Wenn Sie Fragen haben, gehen Sie einfach auf den chat button und schreiben Sie uh, einfach rein. Auf Deutsch ist kein Problem, ich werde Sie dann auf Englisch übersetzen. Also fühlen Sie sich nicht irgendwie, uh, uh, oh God, intimidated, uh, eingeschüchtert, da, wenn Sie nicht ausreichend Englisch beherrschen. And I think that's about, ah, one thing I do want to say. Um, eine, eine Sache möchte ich sagen. Nach diesen Vorträgen öfters fragen die Leute, um, wie kann ich mehr erfahren? Quite often after these talks, people ask, how can I you know, find out more about this topic? And fortunately, we have one version in English. It's for the case. Sorry, I'm just looking for a job guarantee that's at Polity Books. If you look in the back at Pavlina, you can see it. And now, I think about a week ago, this book has appeared. It's just a translation in German. So if you want to you know, read up on this, and uh, as I said, it's a, it's a brilliant book. I'm, I'm, and it's also a great series. That's, uh, it's a very short, they're very succinct, and very simple to understand. They're not for economists, they're written for you know, normal people like you or me. We can read it once and understand. And that's it for us. Pavlina. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to speak today with you and um, your audience. I was reminded this morning that four years ago, I came to Frankfurt for my first talk at the European Central Bank um, that was followed by several others. Actually, I gave two talks that, that day on March 8th. And one was on what is modern monetary theory. And the second was on what is the job guarantee. And it was very interesting experience uh, to speak to central bankers about the job guarantee program. It's not my natural audience though issues on money are of keen interest um, to finance folks. And the main argument that I made at the time is that the job guarantee is a structural macroeconomic policy. So I wanna talk a little bit about what that is 
just as you know, as you noted in the introduction, it has really found a central central place in the Green New Deal conversations. It has found a central place in the social justice conversations. In the United States, uh, the job guarantee was proposed as part of the civil rights struggle. So the proposal in and of itself, or the call for a job guarantee is not new, but I'm hoping that the modern articulation is somewhat new and uh, provides a, a new way of thinking about a new world, a new way of dealing with economic instability of whatever sort it comes, pandemics, financial crises, um, natural disasters, that we have a new way of responding to these naturally to these crises with a new with a tool, a macroeconomic tool for economic stabilization. So I will talk a little bit about that, but I wanted to introduce your audience to some developments that have happened since that first uh, talk or over the last four years. And in the most recent history, um, in the United States, the job guarantee was not only um, put into the Green New Deal resolution, which I discuss in my book, but also it is a centerpiece of a campaign that was launched by the Sunrise Movement uh, just last week. And the Sunrise Movement really changed the conversation on this side of the ocean about climate problems, um, social economic justice. But we also have a representative in Congress, Ayanna Presley who introduced a job guarantee resolution a few weeks ago as well, uh, is working on a bill um, for a job guarantee, as well as there are others in Congress who are also working on um, job guarantee uh, bills. In Europe, there have been some campaigns in France for a green job guarantee. There is keen interest, uh, some members of the European Parliament. There is uh, there is a lot of talk that is happening, not just in the United States, but around the world about what it is. It was put in, into the ILO agenda for rethinking work after the pandemic. So we, we do see, I, I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that we are seeing a, a galvanized effort to rethink, to, to reimagine uh, the future of work with the crucial role of the job guarantee. In the meantime, it was also polled. Uh, in the last few years, there were a number of polls that specifically tested the favorability of the public of the job guarantee, which is very interesting because the public is just becoming reacquainted with the job guarantee. And yet the, the support is there very strong bipartisan support. I discussed that uh, in my book and there are some more updated surveys in the UK and the United States where we are looking at 70% and upwards support for the federal government to provide employment to the unemployed um, in a direct manner as a guarantee. And in some cases that support uh, reaches 90%, but it is bipartisan support. It does straddle the conservative and um, the progressive um, spectrum, sides of the political spectrum. So all of that is very encouraging, very interesting. The way I approach this question in the book is to connect that old conversation about guaranteeing a basic human right to macroeconomic policy. And so it is well known that the right to decent and remunerative employment is part of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There are multiple treaties that recognize this, um, multiple constitutions that do as well, but we don't have a policy. We don't have a um, concerted effort to actually secure that right. Now, I think that partly the trouble is that uh, the conversation has always been, well, this is all nice to have, but we can't really do it. Um, there are hurdles. And so in the, in the book, I hope to dispel some of those myths and to demystify what people might consider to be hurdles towards achieving that. And so, 
you know, I first start with a very simple exercise of asking the, the reader to imagine what would it look like? What would the world look like if there was a public option for good jobs, a, a, a policy where if somebody is looking for employment, they can go to the unemployment office and walk out with a public job option at basic wages and benefits. What would that look like? And those jobs will be in the public service, addressing public needs, environmental, social care needs. And so, you know, I go through this exercise, um, hopefully with, with the aim of appealing to both audiences who might benefit from that program and those who might not directly have to tap into such program ever. Um, and, you know, I, I basically argue with this famous, you know, I start with the famous Seneca quote that it's not because things are difficult that we do not dare, but it is because we do not dare that they are difficult. And so the hope is here to kind of break up some of these calcified notions of what is a good job. Can unemployment be eliminated altogether? And one of the big ones is that unemployment is natural. That is one of the big uh, myths that I'm hoping to debunk in that, um, uh, in the book. What do I mean by that? I, the basic argument um, is that from a macroeconomic policy perspective, we have two options. There are two scenarios before us. We either, move on with the status quo, which essentially guarantees unemployment. We know that unemployment is with us, even in the best of times, even when economies are quote unquote at full employment. There is this pervasive notion that unemployment is unavoidable, inescapable. It always is going to be a consequence of trade, of technological change, you name it. And there just won't be enough jobs for all. But there is also a second aspect um, to this argument that unemployment is unavoidable. And that is the policy, that unemployment is used for policy reasons, for policy purposes. So um, audience, you know, readers who are familiar with the natural rate of unemployment, the Nairu, um, are familiar with the fact that the Nairu is this concept that the, there is an, a level of unemployment that is consistent with price stability and economic stability. And if policy attempts to push the unemployment rate below that level, all sorts of negative cir uh, circumstances happen. We see inflation, we may see um, instability. And so uh, in a very real way, in a very substantive way, unemployment is used as a policy guide where and when uh, the central banks need to step on the brakes and remove any stimulus they might be offering to the economy for fear of rising inflation. And so I, through the book, I, I go through uh, some of these evolving conversations in the United States, you know, Fed Chairman Jay Powell had argued that we need to know what is the right level of unemployment. And by that, he means exactly that, that, you know, if, if uh, unemployment is too low and he uses those words, we might see inflation. What the job guarantee argues is that uh, we do not have to face this impossible choice. We don't have to choose between inflation and unemployment that we have a policy option that can do the macroeconomic stabilization that is currently hoped to achieve through unemployment. In other words, the second policy option is that we can use a direct employment program to expand with recessions and shrink in expansions, much like unemployment does today and achieve price stability with a jobs program rather than the so-called reserve army of the unemployed. So in other words, we, we no longer have these impossible choices from a macroeconomic perspective. Um, so that is the, the one argument that um, I present, that there is nothing inevitable ab about it and that it's not necessary. We do not need to be 
aiming for some natural level of unemployment, which is embedded in every macro model that you will see out there. The second piece of this puzzle is that we are not accounting for the full costs of unemployment. There is ample research on the cognitive costs, on the social costs, on the personal costs, on the scarring effects, on the cost to the unemployed, to their family members, to their children. We are not incorporating that. And if we were to incorporate those already embedded costs of unemployment, then we will see that it's a very expensive proposition to maintain a pool of unemployed on an ongoing basis as a matter of policy design. We can simply do things better. We can employ the unemployed directly and then prevent the evolution of those social and economic costs. I'm gonna pause here maybe. Is this the, a good time to pause for, so that the translators can switch? Yes. By the way, the translators, <laughs> we're doing this because Mona uh, is in Zurich and Florian is in Frankfurt. Those are the two translators. We like to welcome them. This is our first translation. So I think they're ready to continue. Off we go. Thank you. So not only there is no natural, if the concept of the natural rate is, is tenuous. And I should say, even the Fed is admitting they cannot find the Nairo. I mean, this is very important that, you know, they have explicitly acknowledged that they don't have a very good theory of inflation, that the Nairo has broken down. So we, we need to recognize these difficulties and not be wedded to this concept and hold on to it. But also when we account for the social costs, we find that they are large and um, uh, it's, a, it's a vastly inferior uh, macroeconomic uh, approach. When I connect the social cost to the macroeconomic arguments, um, I also look at how unemployment if develops spatially over time. Uh, and I, I make this argument that actually behaves very much like an epidemic, which was an argument that I made before the current pandemic began. And we look at how unemployment behaves, it's very volatile. Um, and that's, that seems to be the case in most countries ar around the world. Even, you know, I was looking at the German unemployment rate, even though it is relatively low by historical standards, if you look at uh, the unemployment rate over the last 20, 30 years, it does yo-yo. It does go up and down and up and down. And, and, that, in, and that means that there are millions of people who are losing, hundreds of thousands of people who are losing their livelihoods and their employment on short order with changes, uh, economic fluctuations. So when you account for how unemployment propagates, how it spreads, the public health concerns that it causes, I think it's reasonable to make an argument that this is a public health concern that needs to be addressed on ongoing basis with preparedness and, and prevention. And uh, finally, I argue that if the other policy option is simply to employ the unemployed, that actually represents a new social contract. It represents a considerable rethinking of what work is um, how we secure the floor, how we ensure that no working person um, works in a poverty uh, paying wage, that we eliminate working poverty, that that constitutes an entirely different policy paradigm that brings in other social benefits. So I just want to speak a little bit about how I see those social, you know, those pillars of this new social contract, and then we can um, open the floor to questions. Um, but there are basic propositions that the job guarantee, the, the, their basic, um, I would say, um, criteria or basic parts of this new social contract that can be delivered by the job guarantee. Um, the first one is that, you know, just to use Bill Vickery's famous phrase, unemployment is vandalism. We do not want to inflict the injury of unemployment on people, and there will be a public option for good jobs, rain or shine. 
The second would be that, as I argued a moment ago, unemployment is no longer necessary. It's not necessary for macroeconomic stabilization. In fact, quite the opposite. It is destabilizing to communities and to the macroeconomy. An economy that operates with unemployment is more volatile economy. The business cycles are more volatile business cycles. A fully employed economy is more stable um, economy overall. The third part is that the public sector is responsible. It has to participate in securing this new social contract because it already participates. The public sector already carries the costs of unemployment. It already pays for all of the uh, costs, monetary or real, that are associated with problems connected to the problem of unemployment. So the, the public sector involvement is unavoidable. It's already there. And the public sector does the automatic stabilization for the economy. That's a given. The question is, can we do it better? And a direct employment approach is um, superior. The other benefit of the job guarantee is that then it secures a labor standard that is um, missing for some people. In other words, if we have a public option at a base wage or benefit, then that's the wage for the economy as a whole. In the US, we struggle to raise the minimum wage. The minimum wage is one way in which we can secure sta stable and well-paid employment. But if you do not find a minimum wage employment, you do not benefit from the minimum wage. In other words, guaranteeing employment is that piece that ensures that it's a truly inclusive economy. If we have unemployment, those people who cannot get into the labor market are excluded from public policy. With the new labor standard, we are saying that uh, no working person will fall below that base wage, and that will be socially determined, um, with including some very basic benefits <clears throat> that will come with a wage. Firms will have to match that standard. I use the example in the United States, but if in the US, you know, there are employers that pay $7, $7.25 an hour, but the job guarantee pays 15, then um, that is that is a competition for the private sector. That is a standard that firms will need to meet to retain their workers. The other important part is that the job guarantee values in both people and the public service. I think that, um, it is um, you know, painfully obvious how many social needs there are out there that are unsatisfied. How many needs communities experience. Um, there are urgent problems ahead of us like the climate crisis. And we have many people who can be um, employed to address those social needs. Those are needs that don't have commercial return they are not done for profit, they're done for the public good and for the public need. And therefore we are recognizing that as social useful work, social useful labor, we're remunerating it the right way. We are supporting those activities and um, we improve overall well-being. So here in this context, we really need to broaden our definition of what's good work. And so it's, it's not this very narrow definition of what is productive work, um, again, in terms of um, you know, output, GDP measures, profit measures, but we are now considering socially useful work, the invisible work, the care work, the work that's necessary to do to maintain the environment, the work of artists, musicians, the creative kind of work. And so the social contract now recognizes that we don't want to have starving artists. Um, okay, uh, finally, we, well, not finally, a few more points. Another point of the social contract, another pillar is that we reject the threat of unemployment as a disciplining tool. I think this is, you know, this is the famous, you know, Kaleski argument that, you know, captains of industry will always resist because they, they would like to have the threat of unemployment. Um, however, um, you know, we can talk about this in the Q&A, but there are certainly programs that guarantee employment today. Uh, the captains of industry certainly have resisted other policies that have made meaningful impact 
on working people. But in this particular case, we also want to reject the idea that people are more productive if they're more afraid. If they're afraid for their work, they become more productive. That is not the case. We know, again, from good you know, uh, cognitive sciences work and uh, survey work that people are actually um, uh, less productive when they're stressed out, when they have less job security, when they have more employment instability. Okay, um, and also eliminating the threat of unemployment increases worker solidarity among workers who are not working and those who are working as their fates are indelibly connected. Um, the next part is that the job guarantee then helps us with these conversations about impossible choices that I discussed earlier. We don't have to have this trade-off between jobs and technology. We can embrace technology to improve our overall well-being, reduce working days, working hours, and still guarantee um, employment for those who need it. Uh, finally, we want to um, embrace democratic design, uh, participatory democracy um, models have shown to be resilient, to be effective, people who are on the ground in the communities where the jobs are created, have an understanding of what the needs are, the local needs are, and thus mobilizing those local networks, giving voice to the unemployed and community members in the design of the project um, also represents a new social contract of what we value and how we organize uh, communities. And um, this kind of bottom-up design is, is something that we have seen um, uh, around the world. And I think it's a, it, it's a good model for implementation. And, and the final piece of the new social contract is that it finally guarantees the right, um, the human right, the rec internationally recognized human right. So I'm going to um, conclude by saying that um, the job guarantee is a kind of re-envisioning of public policy, that there is a, the welfare um, state is in a way um, missing a critical tool for providing for economic security for all. We, and that is um, the employment option. We, are rethinking what the public purpose is going to be in the modern conversations about the Green New Deal. And there are certainly many urgent needs that have to be addressed with bold government intervention and uh, bold um, st strategic investments. But the job guarantee has a very special place in that transition um, because it essentially protects the most vulnerable. It doesn't only, it, it doesn't just permit this mass scale mobilization that uh, people are recognizing is needed, but it also ensures that the most vulnerable, those who are most likely to lose their employment in the transition, will um, have employment security. And the final piece of the Green New Deal is that it recognizes family sustaining wages as the basic standard. And my, my, uh, the addition the argument that I'm adding to this conversation is that we also need that policy to be permanent um, because economic fluctuations are not going to go away even when we transition to the new green future. And then in fact, we have to keep to think about, you know, permanently uh, transforming the way we address economic instability. So to conclude, I, uh, in, in the argument in the book, I argue that, you know, we have once, the international community had once engaged in this conversation about full employment, and it recognized the, the necessity of countries to maintain full employment, even in conditions of free trade, not just as a human right. And so um, the, it's, it's time to re-engage in that conversation and uh, deploy this missing piece of the macro policy agenda. I will stop here. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer questions. I think that before we go over to the questions, I would like to pose one for, because I think most Germans, a lot of people are familiar with universal basic income. 
And if you could clarify a bit what the difference is between a universal basic income and a job guarantee. And then we'll go over to the questions. Yes, um, it's easier to clarify what the job guarantee is because I think that there are many um, proposals for UBI out there. Um, the job guarantee is very straightforward public, public employment opportunity. Uh, if you don't have employment for whatever reason and you seek it, have trouble finding it, the public sector will secure that public option. It's a direct employment in community project public service project that addresses social needs at the base wage with basic wage benefit package. I like to think of it, if you if you will, as participation income, that there are folks who are contributing to community welfare and well being, and they are supported for that. The job guarantee is part of the way we provide economic security. There are other ways. In fact, in the US, the new dealers used to talk about two legs of a strategy, a public sector strategy. One would be the direct employment leg. The other one will be the income support leg because we recognize not everyone can work, should work, will work, and there has to be um, economic security for all. The income support leg can vary. We typically provide income support on the basis of the kind of economic security people experience. Social security, retirement, right, is a type of basic income support. Tuition-free college is a type of basic income support. It's more of a public services guarantee. Um, uh, but it is a, a kind of support for, for a non-working person. Universal child allowance is a universal basic income, if you, if you will, for young, um, for children. Caregiver allowance. I mean, there are many ways in which we can slice this and we can think about income support. But what we seem to be missing is that however generous that income support is, there are people who need work and they cannot find it. And we are missing the direct employment guarantee. Also, what is really important to note is that the most vulnerable are the people who have been outside of the labor market for a long time, caregivers, for example. If they wish to return to paid work, they have a really hard time finding paid employment. And they're last on the queue of being hired. And so the job guarantee is that kind of transitional program. So that's the job guarantee. The universal basic income, I mean, there are many proposals out there. You know, there's a proposal of providing, you know, uh, 30,000 euro per person per year for every person, whether they're working or not. Uh, that's one proposal. There are other proposals of providing just basic income guarantee. It's not universal, as I indicated, universal child allowance. So there are many different proposals. And, um, you know, the, I think part of the difference is that they, they can coexist together because there are multiple dimensions of economic security, but universal basic income is not a substitute for the job guarantee. There are people, there are experiments today where their basic income, you know, to a limited number of people, people look for work and they cannot find it. So we need to have a, um, a supplemental program to create the missing job opportunities. All right, then let us, thank you. Let's just start with the questions. The first one's a rather long one from Louise Koch. I'll just read it. <clears throat> I have an ontological question. The job guarantee assumes a very positive image of humans. For example, about intrinsical motivation to work. I know that the MMT, modern monetary theory, Community says that as long as there are social issues, there are jobs. However, I don't necessarily see how any unemployed people would be suitable. To, don't necessarily see how any unemployed people uh, people would be suitable to fill these positions. I saw how the governments try to motivate people to become nurses and care workers, 
but these jobs do require skills that cannot be necessarily learned, like empathy. To bridge that, I don't see unemployment, unemployed men from the coal sector suddenly working at a woman's shelter. How does the job guarantee image to bridge the discrepancy be, uh, imagine or uh, uh, to bridge the discrepancy between available and needed skills? Thank you. Um, thank you for that question. So I think there are several things to keep in mind. The first one is that the existence and the need for a job guarantee is not necessarily motivated uh, on, on the terms of whether we can fill very specific needs gaps. The problem is unemployment. That's the problem that the job guarantee attempts to fill. And that is somewhat separate from the problem of finding enough nurses. And here's, and both are important problems. They are both, I, I wanna acknowledge that these are, you know, key problems that, you know, a shortage of skills is a key issue that has to be addressed. But the job guarantee is necessary for reasons that I explained and for the large social and economic costs that it brings. When it is designed, then it is designed with the person in mind. It, we like to say that it, we fit the job to the worker. We, we fit the opportunity um, to them and their skill with, um, with an eye to making them successful, helping them be successful, and you know, deploying their, their skills in an in a area of need. So we are certainly not talking about minors taking care of the elderly, but there are already in the US communities, mining communities, who are rethinking what kind of work they can be doing right there in their own backyard. They understand the devastation that mining has had on their natural resources. They already understand the Green New Deal is very crucial, in fact, for their own transition. And so they're rethinking the kinds of jobs, whether it is uh, environmental rehabilitation, whether it is you know, plugging the mines, making man-made lakes, whether it is dealing with uh, plugging the wells uh, from fracking. So it's, you know, we, we are talking about, you know, clearly uh, getting folks to use their skills to contribute. The job guarantee can help with the training problem and the skills mismatch problem. Part of the component I didn't discuss, but you know, in, in most programs and most proposals, we have training, credentialing, um, the various programs that enhance skill set. And you can think of the job guarantee as the on the job training program. So if you have you know, young graduates who are not finding employment, but they're able to go and shadow nurses and get some on the job training, then the job guarantee can provide that need. It can be that springboard. So I think the way to think about these issues is to figure out what is the standard we want to clear. Is unemployment better in addressing these problems that you identify? In fact, it's worse. You know, people who are unemployed, you can give them all the training that you want to give them, but if there's shortage of jobs, they, somebody will lose their employment. There will be some sort of displacement. So we're looking at the job guarantee as compared to mass unemployment. Now, on the value of work, you know, I don't think that this is necessarily an MMT value. That, you know, Yes, we do aspire, we do, we do believe that we can have good things. We do believe that people can have a better life. But I think what we do is we recognize that people want paid work. So this is not, I think is not a moral claim um, on, on our part. I think it's a recognition that people demand paid work. Now there are some people that don't demand paid work but so long as people demand paid work as a society I think MMT would say that we are obligated to provide it because we have the means and we are sanctioning policies that reproduce unemployment. We are actually talking about natural rate. We're actually talking about taming unemployment on the backs of the unemployed. And that is a macroeconomically broken and morally broken paradigm so you know to that degree there is there there is definitely a you know a moral thread 
but it's um, it's uh, it's a recognition of what uh, you know what uh, people are saying that they want. All right. Maybe, the next. Maybe I can just say one other other piece about the market. Yes, because there are the three parts to that question. Like the second, the third part is about government motivating people. And I think this is, this is really a very interesting aspect because our current system is highly punitive, right? We are, we are attempting to, you know, motivate people to um, demonstrate that they are deserving of the public assistance that they rece receive, right? And so when you think about that in the context of unemployment, when unemployment always looms, it's always perennial. Those motivations are always going to be under duress, you know, and we want to be able to motivate people on the right terms where they're not, you know, afraid for the lo loss of their livelihood. Yeah. That's the last All right. One. The next question is in German and I'm, I have to admit I'm having some troubles with it. Um, should the job guarantee, uh, be adapted to the developments of the um, employment market. Um, uh, uh, you know, the the uh, development of the economy going up and down. How how does it deal with this? Okay. <clears throat> so, if I understand uh, correctly, the should it be adapted to the fluctuations in the private private employment? The job guarantee will behave in response to the way the private sector behaves. If the private sector is very volatile and it lays off people in mass, then it, there will be some self-natural self-selection into the public option. So it will naturally act as a buffer. We have seen this with large scale policies. Even though we haven't had universal job guarantees, we have observed very large scale employment policies such as the one I studied in Argentina, but also the job guarantee in India, which is very large. And they do fluctuate with demand. Those are demand driven programs. I do wanna go back to the point that economies that operate at full employment are not this volatile. And so, um, you know, the example that I give for example is uh, you know, look at the immediate post-war era, you know, Nordic countries, Scandinavian countries, where the, you know, public sector for all intents and purposes acted as an employer of last resort. You know, those are low and stable levels of unemployment. They don't fluctuate like that. Um, Japan would be another example, one or two percent unemployment for, you know, a few decades right after World War II. And then when we start, sort of with a new liberal model, we start to see the volatility. Very often I hear the argument, well, how can the job guarantee accommodate these fluctuations? So, you know, the first argument is that there are not going to be such large fluctuations. Uh, but the second argument is how would it accommodate any fluctuations? And, and the reality is that the private sector accommodates fluctuations all the time. So the public sector will have to do that as well. And so long as we have an infrastructure and a policy response that provides these employment opportunities on demand, you can imagine a scenario where there is permanent infrastructure of environmental projects, community projects, after school activities, educational projects that will be able to absorb people as they come and go. Though again, the fluctuations will not be so, um, so large. What are the needs of the private sector? If you mean, do we need to accommodate the de particular demand for particular skill in the private sector? My answer would be that um, we can certainly do that with training through the job guarantee, and that will be a better outcome than what we do with unemployment. All right, the next question is ah, from Stuart, Medina Hella Stuart. Hi, Bavlina, great to see you again. Bill Mitchell and Warren Mosler have been critical of including the job guarantee as a cornerstone of the Green New Deal. They argue that the goal should be to have the smallest job guarantee program possible, and that if jobs are needed to manage the transition to a greener economy, then they should be hired by the public sector. 
How do you stand on this issue? Yeah, I think um, for a very long time, I have argued that the job guarantee should be small. And I think I make that argument in the book as well. But I, I don't think we should like entirely discount um, the, the importance I don't think they're discounting the importance of the job guarantee and the Green New Deal, but I think that there, there, are, there are important ways in which we can think about various guarantees in the Green New Deal. So what I do in the book is I actually highlight three types of guarantees that I see in the Green New Deal framework. The first one um, is a guarantee of a large scale mobilization, right? This is the all hands on deck you know, all skill, all manner of technical know-how, the guarantee that we will make meaningful strategic investments, big and bold enough to transition. In there, there is an income guarantee, okay? Um, you're, I'm sure you're familiar that there is a discussion of guaranteeing a job with comparable wages for fossil fuel workers or guaranteeing early retirement with generous retirement. So there's lots of conversation about guarantees. I think these are important because they are very firm commitment to a new social contract. The second job guarantee, the second guarantee is the safety net that, that there's gonna be a public option at a base family sustaining wage. Now this is very close to what we are talking about, like having a guaranteed public option at a guaranteed standard and floor. And that is for the, uh, for the most vulnerable. Um, and then, you know, the third, uh, as I said, is the, is the new social contract. So the way, um, the way I articulate or I like to see it is that after the industrial strategy is over, we're, the, the job is not gonna be done we're still, as long as there is economic fluctuation, we will need a job guarantee. Now, if we're working within the current paradigm, right? Um, we have a very weak public sector, right? Defunded um, over many decades. So my preference would be very much the same that we fortify the public sector and we, staff the needed areas with the needed skill, know-how, expertise, and that is not your buffer stock. But we will always need some buffer stock. And so, you know, it, I would like it to be small. Should it be the smallest possible? I think that that really depends on the structure of the economy. If you're talking about a developed nation, developing nation, it may be very large. Like if you're talking about a country like India, where 30% of households are participating in the rural job guarantee, it will be very large. And it's very interesting because the Indian program is participatory design. It is very much based on the rural village forums that create their jobs and their environmental, quote unquote, low skills, but 30%. Now, if you're talking about a developed nation with robust public sector, public services, then yes, I think that the job guarantee can be very small and should be very small for another reason. Take, take a country like the United States, 42% of working people earn below $15 an hour, 42%. We certainly don't want a job guarantee that employs 42% of people. What we want is a well-working private and public sector that provides good employment opportunities across the spectrum. Um, and the job guarantee can be that support. Now, how do we get from here to there is, is a question. We might have to have a big job guarantee initially, but you know, if we do a minimum wage along with the job guarantee, then the private sector has another incentive to match the 15 package. So I really think it's a matter of implementation, but the basic philosophy is that yes, we want to have a public sector that is fully functional and staffed adequately, and there will always be the residual employment we have to address depending on stage of development, economic circumstance. All right. So the next one I actually have to translate as well, family sustaining wages. 
does that mean that the wage for um, households of a worker of workers uh, in the job guarantee is going to be adapted to the size of the family? This is again Tina Hoffman. Yeah, there. Are, I mean, <clears throat> there are different ways in which you can uh, look at that. The proposal is for a basic uh, wage with uh, benefits at 15. That will provide income to be anti-poverty, above poverty income for a family of four. Now, there would be some variation, I think, um, not just on the size of, of the household, but also on the region. The size of the household can be addressed by the income support programs like universal child allowance. So um, there would be supplements like that that can help uh, lift others from poverty. In our model, we, we model the job guarantee for the United States. And um, we find that a job guarantee that provides one family member with a full-time job eliminates something like 85% of child poverty. Um, now, there are variations, so not just with size of household, but also regionally. And in that particular case, what states have done, some states have done is have had living wage ordinances that will top up what the federal minimum wage is. So in the current proposal, it, you know, in my proposal, um, it is an effective minimum wage. which can be as it is currently supplemented with living wage supplements in very high cost areas that the states can then implement. All right, um, the next question is also in German. You know, I'm going to do this in English and then in German that you know, people who haven't read it can, uh, our German can understand what it is. So in the GDR, there's a German Democratic Republic, there was a, uh, a sort of state job guarantee. Ein uh, ökonomische Staatsversagen mit unter viel Langeweile, um, which oh God, I gave it which uh, ended in in I assume economic disaster and also you know a lot of people being bored with their jobs. What can one do that the job, job guarantee um, does a better job of, um, of dealing with providing good jobs? I'll read in German quickly. In der DDR gab es eine Art staatliche Jobgarantie, einhergehend mit ökonomischen Staatsversagen und mitunter viel Langeweile am Arbeitsplatz. Was kann man tun, damit die Jobgarantie besser umgesetzt wird? Von Tina Hoffmann. Okay, no, um, thank you for that question. I think it's, it's, it's important to clarify um, that the job guarantee is a, is a job guarantee, it's not a job requirement. I think in East Germany and a lot of the countries in the former um, Soviet bloc, that was a very different model. That was uh, a job requirement and a very large and almost exclusive public sector employment, depending on the country. Now, the job guarantee is very much a policy for, you know, for um, market conditions. Um, and so what it does, it supplements the job creation engine that exists out there, right? It's not government employing everyone or requiring people to work. It provides the work for those who need it and, and are missing it. You can think of it as a, as a little dance. You know, the private sector creates 80% of the employment currently. Um, that would be for the United States. In other countries, might be a little bit less. The public sector in the US creates very little employment. It's about 10% states and with federal government. Then the nonprofit sector is another 10% um, of total employment. And then you have, you know, five to, you know, 10% of the labor force that is seeking employment and not able to find it. So what we're doing is, you know, we have all this employment here and you have, you know, this pool of unemployment over there. And we are saying that we can just employ those folks, those people. Now, 
that create, you know, on the issue of, of boredom and uh, incentives, as I said, this is not a requirement. This is a voluntary program. Like people are not obligated to come and work in exchange for their for their benefits. And if they don't want to work, they don't come in. And if they don't come in, they don't get paid. So it's a job, just like any any other job. Um, I had another point about that, but I forgot. <laughs> Um, it's, a, it's a very different paradigm. I mean, I think that that's, that's really what needs to be recognized. It's demand driven. If, if people want work, uh, we certainly have the ability to create that work and provide it. All right, let's carry on um, to the next question. You do not see it, this is from Folko Bea. You do not see a goal conflict between more employment and the consumption of natural and other resources higher carbon footprint, good question. Not necessarily. Um, it really depends what we're doing with um, the jobs that we are creating and how we are absorbing the wage. I think that that is the concern. I would say, I don't find a compelling argument that people should live in poverty or without income just so they don't consume and they don't destroy the environment. I think that people should consume to be able to sustain a standard of living, but we need to restructure the economy to do it in a sustainable way. In other words, I mean, they could be simple things as, you know, my tomatoes don't need to come from China. You know, I can have a community garden. So it's a matter of how we absorb the wage. Um, I can be paid income and I can pay for childcare right here in my community that is enhancing rather than me commuting an hour to drop off my kid at, at uh, daycare. So there are ways to restructure our lives that, act, that, that are um, enhancing of our well-being. And I think that job care is precisely designed to deal with the environmental concerns. I mean, there is just so much work. I, I use the examples in the United States, but you know, we, can, we can think about uh, Europe, certainly, you know, we have periodic floods and fires, you know, floods in the, in the Midwest, fires on the West Coast, hurricanes, they're decimated communities on ongoing basis. And we, we have a hard time rebuilding them. We can be doing that um, with the job guarantee. We have so much soil erosion. We can be planting mangroves and dealing with those water system and um, you know, doing a blue new deal, um, as somebody called it. So there is work that is, in fact, essential and desperately needed. And then the question is, you know, how do we absorb the wage? So that is then a question of the industrial strategy, not the job guarantee. It's a question of how we get our energy. It's a question of our agriculture and manufacturing. And those are the big, uh, the big questions. Um, yeah. I'm going to interject a question here because it all sounds very theoretical, but we've been here before and we had the original New Deal. Can you explain briefly, because it covers these points more or less, how priorities were set, how they were then enacted, etc. Could you briefly explain? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's a, that's a really good point, that these are not conflicting goals. The New Deal in the US in the 30s was both employment relief and in part industrial strategy. I mean, it, it, we had these big projects like electrification projects right, that, that materially changed the way people lived and provided employment. We, but the New Deal was really the forerunner of the, well, you know, the modern conservation movement. Um, there were so many environmental projects that, um, you know, FDR put in place, there were, there was a tree army that planted 3 billion trees. Um, you know, all of the natural parks uh, were, you know, had the hiking trails. I mean, these are things that are legacy environmental projects that we enjoy to this very day. Um, there were national theater projects, music projects. Um, those were employment relief, but they were, you know, very much enhancing of our well welfare and well being. The fire prevention, a very rigorous program for fire prevention during the New Deal. So again, absolutely correct. We are not reinventing. We are 
we're paying attention to a forerunner that can provide some of these answers with the recognition that the New Deal was not an employment for all who needed employment, it was very successful, very popular with people who worked, but it was small, it was still too small. Um, and then only the war machine demonstrated that we can actually indeed employ absolutely everyone who wanted to work. And, and here, you know, Keynes was arguing that the true test is for us to demonstrate that we can do this for civilian purposes. And I think, you know, what, that experience taught us is that we have the money, we have the real resources, we have the organizational power, we just have to commit to it. All right, briefly a comment from Luis Cole, who we've had the question from. Thank you for your detailed answer. I'm a great supporter of the job guarantee. I'm just in need of answers for when arguing with job guarantee skeptics. So now comes our next question. Germany does already have training programs for the unemployed aimed at getting them back into paid work with mixed results, also because of the signaling value of active labor market programs. And how far is a job guarantee better suitable to promote hiring in the private sector? Thanks, Luis. I mean, the comparison again is compared to unemployment. I think that's why we have mixed results because you know, this is another line from uh, uh, Bill Vickery, who argued that, you know, training is shifting people along the unemployment line, that it's, it's all well and good. Of course, we want more training. But if there is chronic shortage of jobs, somebody is going to be displaced. Somebody is not going to be able to catch that job train. And so um, we don't want just training. We also want to create the missing jobs. I think that's why we have the mixed result. Um, how far is the job guarantee better? It's better than unemployment in, pro in promoting hiring. And, and that is just by virtue of just knowing how firms hire. You know, people with long gaps in the resumes and work experience are last to get a call back. Um, and, you know, those are the most vulnerable people. You know, I should say that we cannot expect the public sector, the private sector to create employment opportunities for all workers. Like, in other words, the job guarantee will never be zero, zero workers. And the reason for that is that, um, you know, the private sector is not in the business of hiring every worker. That's not, not their mission. You know, they, don't, they don't guarantee employment. Um, private sector also has other reasons for not hiring certain people. And some of them are, you know, more legitimate. Some of them are more nefarious. It, there is discrimination out there. There are people who are not able to get a job knocking on door after door sending resumes. The public sector has a responsibility. Those are people who want to work, they can work, and they can certainly contribute to the, to the social well-being. Well and so in, in that sense, I wouldn't say that the success of the program is measured against how well they, it has promoted uh, private sector hiring but we certainly want to be able to move people up from the base wage wherever possible into better employment opportunities out there in the nonprofit, public or private sector labor markets. All right, we're at the end of the questions. I just wanted to pop one in again. Uh, Due to climate change, I think people are starting to understand the concept of externalities with regard you know, to corporations and capitalism. The fact that uh, here for the fossil fuel companies do not pay for the pollution, for the CO2. This is all uh, being left for the public purse to cover. The same thing is true with unemployment. More or less, it's an externality uh, in, in, uh, in this, also for the public purse to cover the cost. And you know, I'm not talking about just the you know, cost of unemployment insurance. I'm talking about you know, the number of suicides you've had in the US, uh, the amount of uh, psychological care that is necessary for people who are unemployed. I mean, unemployment people keep forgetting it's not just someone sitting about having nothing to do it scars and it scars terribly and these are just numbers that i don't know if numbers are available to cover this but these are massive externalities 
that uh, you know costs that are not only financial they're also human costs yeah i this is really a key point critical point i think um so social suicide in some countries is more highly correlated to unemployment than other japan is a classic case however I cite in my book, um, it's a metadata study that looked at, I'm forgetting right now how many 70 different countries uh, where they looked at uh, suicide and unemployment and they found it to be nine times higher than previously believed. There is work on mortality, which is also really interesting because mortality um, uh, you know, there's excess mortality because of unemployment, but that seems to be a permanent effect. Like it's felt 20 years after spell of unemployment. So the scarring effect during unemployment is considerable. And almost every demographic group experiences this. I think with the exception of young women, very young women in their uh, 20s, almost every demographic exp experiences an increase in mortality as a consequence of unemployment. Um, the other scarring effects are, um, economists talk about the loss of income or the problem of graduating in a recession, like what would be the impact on lifetime income, but it's far more than that. It is the loss of social network, you know, the, the loss of the very connections and the very bridges you need to find employment. And then the impact, the psychological impact uh, is measured for spouses and for uh, family members and uh, the effects of health on children. So growth stunting, stunting, there's good research on that, malnourishment, growth stunting. I mean, you know, any and every socioeconomic problem you can think of has some kind of connection to this, to economic insecurity and to unemployment. But what's interesting is, that this research shows that the vast majority of the costs are non-pecuniary. So, um, so it's not just a simple loss of income. And then you connect that to surveys that uh, ask people why they enjoyed employment. And they say income is like a reason four, five, or six. So it's not, the income is actually not the first reason why people want work. And when you combine these things, you, you realize how important a job is uh, for one's livelihood and well-being. And this is one reason why these other interventions, while all well-meaning and important, especially in the absence of a guaranteed job, they're not going to be fully successful. You know, a, a basic income is not going to be completely adequate to provide economic security and the sorts of um, the, the sorts of benefits that, that an employment opportunity can deliver. All right, the next question. What will happen with the jobs created by the job guarantee in case of an economic prosperous phase when the buffer stock shrinks and all the programs for, for example, childcare and nature conservation are left without people to implement them? Isn't that unsustainable? Yeah, I thank you actually for that question, because I think this is an important point and often there's a misunderstanding of what the job guarantee is. The childcare, in my view, has to be permanent and ongoing infrastructure. And that is necessary. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether you work in the job guarantee, whether you work in the private sector, whether you don't work, right? It is part of the social wage that we provide. Now, childcare sites, um, you know, community health clinic sites, those need to be permanent, but they can be the sites for on the job training and job guarantee uh, work. So you can think of the project as permanent, but the jobs potentially as temporary. So when, when we you know, think back to the conversation about fully staffed, adequately staffed public services, nature conservation has to have ongoing maintenance, no doubt. It's like any other thing. But it just so happens that it is very amenable to delaying or accelerating certain projects, right? You know, whether it's sanitation, whether it's tree planting, whether it is rehabilitation, whether it is fish monitoring, like some, the, the project, the 
the program can be there as permanent, but people can come and go um, uh, as, as needed. So I think that these are not lines, these are not incompatible, incompatible problems. And one is not in conflict with another. Like I said, the private sector does things on an ongoing basis and it's able to accommodate people that come and go. Like organizational structure is able to accommodate more people or fewer people. I just don't think that um, we should be worried about people disappearing from nature conservation or childcare. And if we are worried about that, then we pay more and we attract them in another way. All right, I'll get him one more question, especially because it's International Women's Day. The word care keeps cropping up throughout. Uh, and fact is this area of care that's mainly uh, an area where women work. And we know it's very, very poorly paid. Awful conditions, we're seeing this even, you know, during the pandemic where you think society would somehow, somehow show its appreciation of the sacrifice being brought by you know, so many women who work in this area of care. Uh, what are the perspectives for the, you know, the whole complex of care in the job guarantee? Well, I mean, right now we're talking about essential workers. You know, it's the big conversation that the pandemic brought to us. You know, who are the essential workers? How do we thank them? How do we support them? How do we reward their work? You know, it's a, um, we're not making a lot of progress, I think, on, on supporting on supporting them. And we are operating still within the same paradigm. We're still operating within a paradigm that has mass unemployment and that doesn't guarantee employment opportunities um, to those who need them. So what has the pandemic showed us? Um, women have gone back to homes. They have not returned to work because they have care needs, right? The economy has closed. Children are studying remotely. Um, somebody has to do the home care work. And it just so happens it's women, not uh, men in equal numbers. What will happen uh, I mean, certainly they, that work can be helped by a job guarantee. Um, you know, these are not conflicting goals. Just because we have a pandemic doesn't mean that we cannot have a job guarantee. You know, our own teachers are trying to educate their children and our own children. Now, imagine if we had, you know, teacher assistants that could alleviate that burden. And instead of a class of 20 and 30, we had classrooms of five. So it is not necessarily the case that we couldn't do that kind of work in the middle of a pandemic. And there are many other examples that we can think of, you know, guaranteeing employment now and alleviating some of these burdens that women tend to be taking care of. But what happens next when we reopen the economy? Um, women who have been out of the labor force for a year, possibly more, scrambling for the few jobs that are out there, still working within the scarcity of jobs, who's going to get the job first? So it's once again a double whammy um, that they act as that buffer, that social buffer. So in that respect, I think um, the job guarantee is also critical for women's work. I should say in my own work in Argentina, it was very clear that women liked paid work. There was an, an attempt to reform the job guarantee program, actually a very successful attempt into an income support program. And women preferred the job guarantee overwhelmingly, so long as the funding was there. Um, they preferred that to just income assistance for all the reasons that, that we discussed. So we are, we're not recognizing that there is this hidden demand for paid work out there within the household and if we had a full employment program at a base wage, then at least we guarantee that floor, that you know, that basic floor. Of course, the caregivers that are at home that cannot work will not work, and um, uh, they need to be supported too. And there are other programs that exist for that for that purpose. 
Um, in the US, we have a program for, I mean, I think, you know, Germany and some European countries have, ha have more generous support system for caregivers. In the US, we have one for veterans, um, uh, for, you know, caregivers are paid to provide home care for veterans. So there are various models in which, you know, women can be supported. But, you know, one, I think one thing we need, we want to recognize is that, um, you know, we're not doing that not only because we are operating within the wrong paradigm that we cannot create the employment opportunities, but also because you know, we have starved the public sector of financial resources. And that's another, another big hurdle we have to overcome. All right, the last question, uh, Louise is the one and again. Would a job guarantee be open to everyone independent of citizenship? It depends what the law is. Um, under the US law, that will not happen. Um, we believe that um, it should be open to people who are, reside within our communities. Um, in the US, we have millions, you know, about 12 million undocumented people who have lived here for um, years and decades, and their children are here, and they're, they are, you know, they're parts of our community just like any other. So we have a very big problem with, uh, you know, sorting out a path to uh, citizenship, but we have a program for their children. So we do have a, a, a DACA program that uh, actually accelerates path to citizenship with an employment opportunity. The job guarantee, I think, could be open to those young men and women um, to help with that process. Yeah. All right, we, we will get in one more question from Feline Edbauer. With the job guarantee, will certain restrictions for the financial market be necessary? Well, I think that you can have a job guarantee even with the vagaries of financial markets today. And in fact, you know, that's a critical safety net when again, the collateral damage of financial crisis happened to be people and low wage workers. I think that all sorts of reforms are necessary. You know, what we're looking for, you know, I, I emphasize the job guarantee just to recognize that we're already paying for unemployment and then there's a better way to stabilize the economy. But um, it's important to say that this is, we can't hang our hat on that. That is not the panacea for our problems. We have a financial sector that is run amok uh, and is uh, extremely destabilizing to the economy. So I think with or without the job guarantee, we do need to address that problem. And that is the same with any other uh, problems that we see in our, our economy, whether it is mon monopoly power, um, whether it's financialization, um, whether it is you know, the huge uh, concentration of, of business. We have a lot of work to do. <laughs> All right. Pavlina, thank you very much. I want to note that, um, once again, if you want to have a good overview of, of uh, the job guarantee, there's, as I noted initially, the case for a job guarantee by Pavlina, which appears at Polity Press. And then, as I said, there's also this in German, plaidoyer, if you want a job guarantee, there's just a direct translation. And that's Lola Books, and someone was kind enough to put up a connection, uh, a link to the book pretty much up the chat list. So if you are interested, you can just go there and order the book. Pavlina, thank you very, very much for taking the time. This is our first encounter with Job Guarantee on, um, on these podcasts for Brave New Europe. We will, for those who want to see this again in about a week's time, we have it up on the website as a you tube film so you can have a look again. Pavlina, um, thank you thank very, very much again. Thank okay. you very much for the great questions and best of luck. All right. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thanks. And thank you to the audience. Very, very good questions tonight. Bye to everyone. <laughs>